Pixar couldn't have released the movie Soul at a better time. 2020 was a year of many things. Devastation, transformation, depression, inspiration, and total confusion to name a few. With respect to the devastation of 2020, there were some bright spots. The main of which is the great pause. Humanity has been in a phase of the out of balance masculine for hundreds of years. 2020 gave us the opportunity to slow down and look within, which many have done. Pixar's latest hit film, Soul, is all about pausing, being in the moment, and soul seeking, of course. The release date, Christmas Day of 2020. Literally, this movie couldn't have been released on a more timely day. Christmas is always a time of slowing down a bit to be with family. With the lockdowns and social distancing of 2020, more families would have been more likely to be at their homes without extended family and friends Christmas weekend. And with the buzz of social media and Disney's prevalence in our culture, Soul would be the likely movie to watch Christmas weekend with the family. So let's go ahead and talk about the movie, which by the way, spoiler alert, go ahead and come back later if you haven't seen the movie. So let's get on with it. Joe Gardner, the main character, is a music teacher who hasn't quite hit his big break quite yet. In the opening scene, we see Joe leading a classroom of students in band. Well, a dysfunctional class, really. You can see the frustration in Joe's face as the music is off key amidst kids looking bored and overall just not interested. The classic childhood memories of tossing paper airplanes through the room mixed in with another student nearly sleeping and another on his phone instead of being present with his instrument. This is until one of the students, Connie, finds herself in the zone and flows into her own tune. Joe's face changes to awe and wonder until the classroom starts laughing at Connie, the student. This interaction demonstrates a couple things. First, a major foreshadowing about the intention behind the movie, being in the zone and finding your spark, just as Connie did when she got lost in the music. But we'll explore that more soon. The second thing this illustrates is the toxic behavior of our society. Later in the film, we see Connie come to Joe exclaiming she's going to quit music altogether. This is a commentary on how our judgmental nature can create stories in others' minds which lead to suffering. Anyway, let's get back to the scene. After Connie gets lost in the music, Joe calms down the classroom by explaining getting lost in the music is a good thing. From there, we see a memory of Joe and his youth with his dad at a jazz club. This gives us a glimpse into just how long Joe has been fueled by music and his connection to jazz specifically. In fact, we even get a key insight into a major theme of the movie as Joe finishes by saying, that's when I knew I was born to play. Okay, let's get right into it. Soul is a movie about finding your purpose in life, the key to life, which I'll share my interpretation later, karma, soul contracts, even spirit guides, and most of all, an awakening. Going back earlier to what I said about 2020, I used the words transformational and inspirational intentionally. See, many of us in the spiritual community have viewed this year as the catalyst to an awakening on earth. The main lesson Joe learns by the end of the movie is to slow down, to be more present, to appreciate being in the moment. Most people that experience a spiritual awakening can attest that it's a feeling of being in awe throughout what would be perceived as the smaller moments in life. I believe that this movie is subtly planting seeds in the mainstream culture which will help us as a collective to awaken. By the end of the movie, the common viewer would look at Joe as a more fulfilled person. It's now up to us to continue the message and intent of the movie soul to provide deeper lessons for certain themes. So with that, let's go ahead and dive into some woo-woo themes of the film. First, we have to acknowledge Joe's uncertainty when the school principal comes to Joe with good news. She lets him know that he's no longer going to be a part-time employee. He gets an offer to be a full-time teacher, 
with job security, medical insurance, and pension too. What more could one want? Well, it's obvious by Joe's reaction, he sees the end of pursuing his dream as a well-established pianist in a jazz band. That is, until he gets a call from a former student. Now, I'm a big fan of the hero's journey concept by Joseph Campbell, which, by the way, huge shout out to my Fit for Service fam through Aubrey Marcus's fellowship, in which we've gone through our own rites of passages with. But anyway, Joe gets the call, which is literally the second stage in Joseph Campbell's well-known hero's journey story architecture. The hero must first get the call to adventure in this 12-step journey. Joe's former student, Carly, calls him with the opportunity of a lifetime. He invites Joe to perform with Dorothea Williams, who we can infer must be a well-known jazz musician. Now, Joe must decide, should he listen to his daemon and pursue his dream, or listen to his mother and play it safe by staying steadfast with his brand new full-time position at school? Which, by the way, let's talk about the Damon philosophy for a second. Thanks to my brother, Eric Godsey, I've learned that the Damon is a whispering from your higher self. In other words, a whisper from your soul, a deep yearning for something more, almost as if it's to follow your destiny in your lifetime. Joe hears his Damon calling for him to pursue the opportunity to perform with Dorothea Williams and chooses to answer the call to adventure. Now, before we go on, this whole philosophy of the hero's journey is something that I want to address. Yes, pretty much all movies use the hero's journey model. However, after personally spending a year in the Fit for Service Fellowship, where we themed each month of the year based on the hero's journey, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt how impactful and more fulfilled you'll be in your life if you choose to be the hero of your own story. Said another way, when things go wrong in life, or not as you would have liked at least, Instead of saying, why is this happening to me? Say, why is this happening for me? For more on the hero's journey, check out the notes in the description of this video to see Eric Godsey's journaling course, which will crack you wide open and have you motivated to pursue your dreams. Well, back to the movie. After Joe answers the call to be the pianist in Dorothea Williams band, we see him at the audition where he initially stumbles, but Joe quickly gathers himself and finds himself in the zone. Now this scene is truly the first moment in the movie where it gives us goosebumps and some spiritual insights to set the stage for what's to come. We see Joe playing piano in a whimsical cloud of blues and purples, his own world away from the rest of the band. Joe's literally somewhere else. He's not on stage with the other musicians. He's not even in the jazz club. He's floating in what the writers of the movie refer to as the zone. This is actually a huge theme in spirituality. It's the belief that while we are in our bodies living out a human experience, we are actually, in fact, multidimensional spirits simply having a human experience. In other words, Joe's higher self, remember from earlier, higher self basically means your soul is now in another dimension. Confusing, right? I know. Okay, so I like to think of it as this. As much as you can touch yourself and feel that you're here in this 3D plane, you also can remember back to those times in life where your consciousness felt like it took a back seat. We can call it daydreaming if you'd like. Well, here's what's actually happening. We are channeling from our higher selves. Now, I know I just threw out a bunch of woo-woo terms, so I'll zoom out for a second. Channeling is often referred to when a human is conveying a message from a spirit. However, what's less common is the fact that channeling can come through from your higher self. What we're seeing here is a spiritual being having a human experience while channeling the gifts from its higher self which is portrayed as the human being in the zone. Make sense? I know it can be a lot to take in if you aren't familiar with the concept. So to go a bit deeper on this theme, 
I highly recommend checking out the documentary from 2016, First Contact by Daryl Anka. You can find the link in the description of this video. Well, anyway, after Joe comes back to his body in the earthly realm, we see Dorothea Williams impressed and invites him to perform with the band the next night. Now, before we move on, I want to point out that Joe says, sorry, I zoned out. This is a nod to the audience that being in the zone is in fact being somewhere else other than the 3D reality we usually think of being most real in an existential type of way. Again, the stage is set for this movie to go much deeper about the human experience than your average film. In the immediate next scene, we see Joe's enthusiasm and ego, which in fact is the shadow of his personality, which led him to his untimely coma. Joe is shown rushing through the streets on the phone, exclaiming with enthusiasm to a friend that he got the gig without any regard to other humans, so much so that we see him nearly get run over by a bus until he eventually falls deep down in a pothole. So where Joe Lando? Well, next we see a beautiful transition of the 3D world to a black background with a deep type noise, which is what we think of as the afterlife. Joe's now at a third of his human size in a shadowy, glowing, blue rainbowy, cotton candy ghost-like form. Joe has found himself on a conveyor belt, taking him to the great beyond. This scene gets me every time. The artist captured returning to the light as much as any human visualization could possibly do. So we need to pause again because this is a huge theme in itself. Many of us believe that we're all one, but what does it mean to be one? I believe that God, great spirit, source, or whatever terminology resonates with you created souls as an extension of itself. The idea is that at some point a soul would return to the light as in source, as in God, as in going back home to be one with the universe. Now this concept is so deep that unfortunately we just don't have the time in this short video to explore this further. However, my homie Joe Hawley has a podcast called Quantum Coffee in which he specifically dives into the question, why are we here? Another resource you might like is the show Initiation on Gaia TV that directly answers the origins of humanity from a soul that didn't go through the veil of forgetting. Okay, so now you might be thinking to yourself, what's the veil of forgetting? You see, as our soul enters the human experience, it goes through a phase of forgetting. The idea is the human experience on earth is a school. And part of going to school is going in without having all the answers. Thus, a veil of forgetting is now necessary for us to learn the lessons in our human experience that our soul desired. Now, after this short rabbit hole to explore the greater universe at play, it's time to get back to the movie Soul. After Joe realizes he may be dead, he chooses to not accept his death and jumps off the conveyor belt and into space. Now, this next scene, this one's epic. And trust me, I only use the word epic when something is truly epic. When Joe jumps off the conveyor belt, we see him travel through dimensions. The human experience is in the third dimension. It's literally called 3D. There are multiple dimensions of reality. And when Joe takes this leap, we see him traveling through time and space where he lands in the great before. So the great before is a mystical dimension of creation. It's here we meet the Jerry's. Jerry is literally explained in the film as the coming together of all quantized fields of the universe, appearing in a feeble form your human brain can comprehend. Um, what? Basically, the writers are reminding us that as humans, we are not the center of the universe and that our brains cannot actually comprehend the dimensions of the entire universe. 
This is a pretty powerful moment in the film for us folks that live, sleep, and breathe spirituality much as I do. Anyway, one of my favorite themes of the great before is the introduction to human design, astrology, soul contracts, spirit guides, and in a sense, referencing that we choose our human experience. Everything from our personality traits to our passions and whom we'll be working with to play out our karma in the human form. Okay, so the film doesn't dive into any of these themes specifically for an extended period of time. The writers leave it to our imagination, but no worries, I'm here to explain some of this for you. So first off, I do have to say, this is a bit differently than the writers take the movie soul does not actually indicate that they believe a soul would choose their personality traits as shown when the jerry's are assigning personality traits however i'm a believer that we choose our personality traits rather than our emotions being a result of astrology I see it as the soul entering the earthly realm at the moment in time to which astrology will act as an aid in the soul achieving its mission in the human form. Astrology is common in our culture. What's not as common is human design. Human design is a new age concept that explains how you can best live out your human experience with the conditions in which your soul incarnate. For more on human design, I highly recommend checking out my buddy Jordan Rami's content. You can hear him explain human design on my podcast, Soul Seeker, which is linked in the notes of this video. Next, let's talk about soul contracts. Unfortunately, I didn't see any trace of the film Soul referencing soul contracts, but I'm a big believer in the concept of soul contracts in explaining and giving meaning to our relationships with others. So since we're talking about the great before, now's the time to explain this concept. Before I go any further, I really want to stress the importance of checking out Carolyn Mace's book, Sacred Contracts. I recommend listening to the book on Audible because she reads it and she's an extremely engaging speaker. In the book, Carolyn describes the concept of soul contracts as our souls having a meeting with other light beings to discuss the lessons we want to learn in our next incarnation. We literally choose other souls to incarnate to help us progress in our life. Soul contracts is the belief of choosing our traits and our karma to work through with other souls. Now, finally, I'd like to talk about spirit guides. The movie Soul introduces Joe as a mentor in the great before. As a mentor, he meets another soul named 22. Joe's role as the mentor, rather spiritual guide, is to literally guide 22 in its human experience. Personally, I grew up knowing absolutely nothing about spirit guides. In fact, I only first heard about spirit guides in 2019 when I found myself in a sacred ceremony to drink ayahuasca. In the spring of 2019, I heard my daemon yearning for more than just achieving goals and dealing with recurring depression on and off for many years. That's why I made the decision to heal with the plant medicine that is ayahuasca. My healing from this experience catapulted me on a search to learn more about the human origin story. And during this exploration is when I found out about spirit guides. Unfortunately, so many of us just didn't grow up with spiritual teachings. So in case you're not familiar with spirit guides, the main concept is that we have guides on the other side that are always watching out for our best interest. With intentional prayer, we can call on our guides to help steer us in the right direction. The time 1111 is widely known as an angel number. In fact, there are many other angel numbers, most of which are repeating numbers. When you see these numbers, it's often a good sign. It's a sign that your angels, rather your guides are with you. In the case of the movie Soul, the mentors in the great before are actually spirit guides for the souls getting ready to enter Earth. Joe's first assignment is to help 22 find its spark. As described in the movie Soul, your spark is your biggest passion in life, a reason for living, if you will. 
But before Joe's opportunity to guide 22 in finding its spark, he's faced with a life review. Another concept you can learn about in Carolyn Mace's book, Sacred Contracts. During the life review, a soul sees their life from a broader perspective to, well, review their life. Unfortunately for Joe, after seeing his life review in his human state in a coma, he despairingly says, my life was meaningless. This is when Joe once again chooses to not accept his looming death and becomes determined yet again to get back to the 3D realm in which he's Joe Gardner. To get back in his body, Joe comes up with a plan to help 22 get an Earth Pass, which 22 can then pass off to Joe to get back in his body. To get an Earth Pass, 22 must earn a badge of finding its spark. This is when Joe and 22 enter the hall of everything for 22 to find its spark. Unfortunately for Joe, 22 is unable to find a passion despite being in the hall of everything from sports to photography to food and well, anything else you could ever imagine. The sad truth is that 22 represents the common human experience. Many of us have either lost our spark in effort to work to sustain a life without a fear of lack, or just have trouble finding things that light us up. 22's character is a commentary on how a lot of humans feel about their life. But don't worry, by the end of this, we'll reflect on how 22 overcomes this hurdle, much like those of us feeling lost in life can as well. So at this point, Joe seems to be on track to go back to the great beyond after failing at mentoring 22. The great beyond is where he'll merge back with Source and never be able to fulfill his earthly dream of performing with a well-established jazz band. That is until 22 takes Joe to the astral plane. Remember earlier when I mentioned the zone being a place that we enter in another dimension? At this point in the film, the writers directly explain the zone as being the space between the physical and the spiritual. In other words, when your higher self is directly expressing itself in human form. It's in this plane of existence that Joe meets Moonwin a soul that can help Joe enter back into his body. But here's the interesting part. Moonwin is actually living out a human existence. The not so hidden meaning here is that while he's incarnated on earth, his higher self is living out its own existence. Okay, so this is yet again, another deep and somewhat confusing concept if you haven't thought about it before. Without getting too deep on this, let's go ahead and talk about time for a second, because after all, time only exists on Earth in this 3D human experience. The belief here is that we are playing out all of our past, current, and future lives at the same time, for lack of a better word. Meanwhile, our higher self is actively doing its thing in the astral realm. So in this case, Moonwind's higher self is meeting the soul of Joe to help Joe's soul wake up from his current coma state to get to the jazz club to perform with Dorothea Williams. But before Joe has the opportunity to enter the earthly realm, we see what's labeled as a lost soul. The film explains a lost soul as the shadow of being in the zone. In other words, when the joy of being in the zone becomes an obsession, it becomes disconnected from life, resulting in its lost state. This specific concept is directly relatable to myself because prior to my awakening through the tool of plant medicine, I was lost in chasing goals and crossing them off to only feel more and more empty as I continued in an ever ending loop of chasing what I thought I wanted. Anyway, the lost soul in this scene is showing saying, make a trade over and over again. We're shown that its human self is lost in its human experience to suffering from living to work rather than working to live. 
Moonwin and his team uses the power of vibration through music to literally awaken the soul. And the next thing we see is the human version of the soul ecstatic when it awakens. In fact, so enthused that he destroys the office. This is a subtle reference to the importance of integration. Many people in the world right now are waking up. But waking up is oftentimes an experience that needs time to integrate. If you feel like you're going through a sort of awakening, I highly recommend chatting with my friends, Celeste McQueen, Sarah Howitt, and Kyle Dow. You can find their website with more info in the notes of this video. Now let's go ahead and climb back up from the rabbit hole of awakening. As Joe is attempting to enter his body, he's instructed to breathe into his crown chakra, which is a clear reference to getting into a meditative state. Once again, we're shown the significance of vibration through music and how it can aid to elevate states of being. Through Joe's meditation, he's able to find himself on earth in a hospital. A portal opens up and this is when it's time. It's time for Joe to enter back into his body, but something goes wrong. Joe shows his lack of patience and jumps into the portal, accidentally bringing 22 with him. This is foreshadowing the purpose of the movie and the key to life as I call it, which I promise we'll get to. So much to Joe's chagrin, to say it gently, he enters the body of a cat while 22 enters Joe's body. Now Joe and 22 are forced to work together to adjust to their earthly 3D and extremely dense bodies. When 22 and Joe are shown exiting the hospital, we see Joe's body, whose soul is 22, now cringe at the noise of traffic. As a viewer, we are now given the opportunity to view our lives from a different perspective. Fast paced, loud, and somewhat, if not a lot of it, chaotic. 22 understandably experiences a panic attack to which Joe as the cat is able to calm 22 down by giving her some pizza. We're shown the power of what's known as grounding. Grounding is anything that can bring us back to our bodies. And in this case, 22 is brought back through nourishment. Even more interesting is the emotions and feelings associated with the bite of pizza. We're shown 22's higher self jumping in circles of joy from experiencing the cheesy pepperoni and marinara infused deliciousness that is pizza. Next, we see Joe and 22 finding Moonwind's human self and them devising a plan to switch their souls into the correct body. Here, we are given another glimpse into astrological events. Moonwind describes an exact time to meet based on when certain planets will align that will result in a thinning of the veil. This is a ton of jargon, I know. Think back to the veil forgetting we mentioned earlier. This veil is what separates the 3D realm from the higher dimensions. It is believed that when the veil thins, we are able to connect with spirits and more mystical elements of the universe. For more on this concept, check out Shawnee Nicholas, who wrote a book called You Were Born For This. Not long after this, we see Joe and 22 at his apartment, which is when Connie, Joe's student, comes back in the movie. Like I mentioned earlier, this is when Connie comes to Joe to exclaim she's going to quit music for good. 22, as Joe, connects with Connie over a serious and unacknowledged fact by most of the mainstream. Connie says, school is a waste of time. And that triggers, in the positive meaning of triggering, of course, 22 connecting with Connie. 22 quotes George Orwell, who famously wrote the book 1984, by saying, the ruling class's core curriculum stifles dissent, which basically means that the education system is designed to keep the masses slaves to the system to give us just enough to not ask questions. I have recently coined the term soul life balance. You see, I believe that the concept of work life balance 
was part of our brainwashing to help the masses accept that we spend a large portion of our life working rather than living. In fact, most of our life is spent working. Work-life balance helps us look forward to something. We've become proud to exclaim we're weekend warriors. We accept our working days with the promise of living out a relaxing vacation and we contribute money to our retirement savings so that when we are old, we can finally be free of working. How does any of this make any sense? I propose that the new model could be soul life balance in which we look at work as a component of life and dedicate more practices to feed our souls on a daily basis to help connect us with our higher self so we're living and speaking our truth while pursuing our dreams okay rant over let's get back to the movie this clip was just a quick snippet but it deserves more attention if this resonates with you at all please check out my podcast soul seeker which is linked in the description of this video and can be found on any of your favorite podcast platforms okay let's move on so 22 witnesses connie in the zone while playing her trombone this is the first glimpse of when we see any sort of inspiration come through from soul 22. 22 starts to obsess over how Connie could go from feeling overwhelmed and anxious by wanting to quit to experiencing love through expressing her higher self with an instrument. And that's when 22 decides to find her spark on earth. After a haircut gone wrong, the two find themselves in a barber shop, and it's this scene that explores some existential questions around the human experience. 22 tells her stories of meeting mentors after mentor without finding her spark, and she gets to the point of asking, is all this living really worth dying for? This sentence in itself directly relates to the human fear of death, which by the way, I can directly speak to the feeling of no longer fearing death after an awakening experience with something similar to plant medicine. For more on that, check out my podcast, Soul Seeker. Anyway, after 22 asks this question, she hears from the barber's explanation of his life, and that's when 22 starts to piece the puzzle pieces together. It's about experiencing. We're going to move on. More on experiences soon. So after the barbershop, 22 is a whole new being. We see her as Joe walking through the street, being present with life. This is a vast contradiction between her way of living and Joe's. Joe is on a mission with blinders. He's not paying any attention to anything going on other than living in a future state where he can visualize him performing at the club with Dorothea Williams. Whereas 22 is fully present. We see her being present with all the senses, from seeing a sign on a post with an offering to expressing creativity through running her hand through the railing to make a musical sound, all the way to a simple pleasure of feeling the air from the subway gutter to express an inner childlike experience. This is living. It's experiencing what life has to offer by being present in the moment. I'd be doing you all a disservice if I didn't point out the lyrics of the man singing in the subway. We shall come around to touch eyes again. If love is the foundation, if the purpose beats a recycled life, I promise you I'll bring us to one bleeding heart in the end now. To me, what I heard are a few themes, first of which is reincarnation. Next, the oneness we spoke about earlier, and finally, love. I'm not gonna be cheesy and say love is the answer, but hey, maybe it is. So all the while, 22 is infatuated by this man's music. Meanwhile, Joe, as the cat, is playing the victim role. Joe chooses to look at life from the perspective of why is this happening to me 
as he starts to believe he might never get back into his body to live out his dream in performing in a well-established jazz band. The victim mentality is something that doesn't get addressed enough in the mainstream. So it's so encouraging to see Disney show this as a shadow expression. We have the opportunity to look at everything in our life from a lens of why is this happening for me? And what is the lesson here? Earth is a school, so let's use it as one and be present with the lessons. All right, moving on to witness karma and soul contracts. In the very next scene, we see Joe speak his truth to his mother, speaking up, or as we say in the conscious community, speaking your truth is the embodiment of living out your soul's mission. It's choosing to make a stand for what you believe in and what my FFS fam affectionately refers to as playing big rather than playing small. Now is Joe's time to shine as he gathers the courage to speak his truth to his mother. Joe speaks from his heart for what we can only assume may be one of the first times Joe truly told his mom just how much he wants to fulfill his lifelong dream. Through speaking his truth, his mom softens and they both connect on a deeper level. So much so, Joe's mom goes from an obstacle to overcome to an ally to help him fulfill his dream by tailoring his dad's special suit for his big night at the club. In the next scene, we see 22 as Joe sitting down and feeling the cold brisk of the air, hearing the joy of a child's laugh to watching the wind roll a leaf right into her hand as Joe. This is when it all comes together for 22. She doesn't know it yet, but this is when she found her spark. Her spark is the entire message of the movie. The moment I've been teasing from the very beginning, 22 discovers the spark of being present and embracing all the experiences of life. 22 explains her range of emotions in her human experience as Joe from feelings of awe, nerves, and fear. In fact, 22 mentions she even liked the feeling of being scared. While this may sound counterintuitive, what we're witnessing here is the playing out of God wanting to experience itself and doing so in the human form without judgment of the labels good and bad. So back to 22's purpose, nearly every spiritual teacher will contribute slowing down, breathing, and being present as a clear path to a more fulfilled existence. Our society, especially in the West, is go, go, go. We're always on the rush, we're always looking forward, and as a result, we're anxious, for we're hardly ever just present in the current moment. 22 spark of being present is the path for anyone feeling lost to regain the reins of life and move with the river of life as opposed to fighting upstream. This is a magical scene when you can relate this to your own life. And I highly recommend re-watching this whole film, by the way, or at least this scene at the 65 minute mark. Next, 22 and Joe finally have the chance to switch bodies, but unfortunately, 22 no longer wants to go back to the great before, so she chooses to abandon the mission. During a classic movie chase scene, 22 and Joe once again enter a portal, a portal that brings them back into the great before, where they are faced to meet the Jerry's and the spiritual accountant Terry, who's been on the hunt for Joe since the beginning of the film. When 22 meets with the Jerry's, we learn that 22 finally earned its earth pass, which we now know was from finding the spark of being present in the moment. After some confrontation between 22 and Joe, Joe meets with the Jerry to reflect on the earthly experience with 22, to which Joe learns from the Jerry that sparks aren't a soul's purpose. Furthermore, the Jerry kind of belittles Joe a bit about his quest for finding his life's purpose. 
This is a nod to the existential meaning of the universe and the rabbit hole to explore multidimensional existences. Seriously, if this interests you, check out Initiation on Gaia TV or Dr. Joe Dispenza's work through his book, Becoming Supernatural and the show Rewired on Gaia. Anyway, back to the movie. Joe refuses to accept what the Jerry says and he heads back down to Earth with 22's Earth Pass back into his body where he rushes once again to the jazz club to once and for all live out his dream or rather what he considers his purpose. Joe makes it to the club and wins back his role to play with the band. The experience is literally a dream come true. Joe enters the zone and improvs with Dorothea between his piano and her saxophone like a match made in heaven, almost as if it was a soul contract playing out in the human form. Hmm. I guess that'll give you something to consider later on. So anyways, the concert ends and Dorothea and Joe debrief for a quick second outside of the club before they head home. As they do, Dorothea exclaims that you get a hundred shows and one of them is killer. You don't get many quite like that. To which Joe awkwardly asks, what's next? To which he's disappointed when Dorothea simply says that they'll come back tomorrow and do it all again. Here's a point in the film that struck me to my core. If you've ever experienced chasing and chasing a life dream to fulfill it and only to feel empty, then you know the feeling Joe had as he says, I've been waiting on this day for my entire life. I thought I'd feel different. You've likely felt this way too. Think back to when you achieved a major accomplishment in your life. Most of us achieve only to feel let down. The issue goes back to the chasing of future successes and not being in the present moment. This point is made clear for a final time with Dorothea telling Joe a story of a fish telling another fish he's trying to find the ocean. To which the older fish tells the younger fish looking for the ocean, hey bud, you're in the ocean. So the younger fish responds by saying, this is water. What I want is the ocean. This is simply a matter of perception, a perception of being so focused in the future and the feeling it will bring without being present with your current state in any moment. The fish is so blinded by the desire to be in the ocean that he can't feel the magnificence that the ocean has to offer. This is a soul changing experience for Joe as he now goes into a deep state of reflection. You see, it's often the case that dark times bring transformation. Dark times encourage going within, a soul-seeking quest, one might say. To bring us back to the chaos of 2020, this is what I was alluding to when I mentioned the timeliness of this movie to offer some inspiration to our current reality through a different lens, a lens of an opportunity to choose to say no to the powers that influence our society to be fear and victim based, an opportunity to choose to see things as happening for you rather than to you. This is a time of darkness, which encourages slowing down, which will result in a collective consciousness shift from fear to love. If we can all spread messages of love rather than fear. Okay, rant over. Back to the final moments in this masterpiece of a film. In the next scene, we see Joe in his apartment where in his reflection, he pieces it all together and sees the human experience from 22's lens. He looks at 22's collection of memories through things like a leaf, pizza crust, and knitting spool, to name a few. This is the moment Joe gets it. The key to life is to experience. We don't label experiences good or bad. We take them for what they are, and we can do this by coming back to our breath in the present moment. Joe's heart opens as he relives 22's memories as Joe. He thinks back to the moments in life when he was most present, and it's in this moment that he awakens. 
guys, every time I watch this scene, it gives me chills, which by the way, something I recently learned from Tim Corcoran is that our higher self sends you messages through feelings in your body. I've always said things like, oh, that gave me chills, but I never thought of it as a way of my soul or even spirit guides communicating with me through my body. If this concept is new to you and you want to learn more, be sure to check out the Soul Seeker podcast, episode number 71 with Tim Corcoran. Anyway, that's the last tangent. Let's wrap this up, shall we? After Joe awakened, he now knows he has the tools to re-enter the astral realm and he can do so by entering the zone. As he enters the zone in the astral realm, Moonwind helps Joe to rescue 22 from her disconnection from life itself as a lost soul. Joe rescues 22 from being a lost soul when he explains to her that she found her spark. As he says, your spark isn't your purpose. That last box fills in when you're ready to come live. Now let's think about this for a second. This entire movie has Joe chasing his purpose, right? If this entire time Joe was chasing a purpose, yet a purpose isn't tied to life, then how did Joe get an earth pass to begin with? Wouldn't Joe have had to been in the great before knowing this well? You see, my friends, this brings us full circle on the theme of going into existence as a human through the veil of forgetting. As I mentioned earlier, before we entered this earthly realm into this current incarnation, we come through a portal to earth without the knowledge of existential existence that our higher self might just already embody. Pretty deep, right? So in summary, the movie Soul follows the hero's journey model from two perspectives, 22 and Joe's. 22 and Joe each have an opportunity to live out every stage, including being the mentor and the hero. The movie concludes with Joe giving 22 her Earth pass back so that she can experience Earth now that she has found a spark to anchor her in the human realm. And Joe is given an opportunity to go back to Earth as Joe. And when he's asked by the Jerry how he'll live out his days, Joe simply and confidently says, I'm not sure, but I do know I'm gonna live every minute of it. With the final scene showing Joe taking a deep breath in, which brings me to my final tool to help you on your path of maintaining soul life balance, breathwork. Breathwork in itself is a transformational and an awakening experience. After I did breathwork for the first time, I literally felt reborn. You can find more about that in podcast number 13 of Soul Seeker, where I describe in depth my rebirth through breathwork. Another resource to learn more about breathwork is through one of my mentors, Aubrey Marcus, and a recent podcast interview he did with Wim Hof. Check out the notes in the description to find the link for episode number 278 of Aubrey's interview with the Wim Hof. So there you have it. The not so hidden meaning of spirituality in Pixar's movie, Soul. Now remember friends, the key to life is to be present and you can do so by finding your own soul life balance. If you're looking for community, I'd love to have you in my free Facebook group called Soul Seeker Tribe. You can find the link in the notes section of this video. Thank you so much for answering the call to be the hero of your journey. And my hope is that by watching this video review, you'll now have some resources to take you a step further in your path. Till we meet again, my name's Sam Cabert, and you can find me by Googling my name. There's only one person with it. And remember, just breathe.